Welcome to this quick start video that allows you to demonstrate that your BBC Microbit is part of the Internet of Things. Here, we assume that you've already set up your device and can flash a MicroPython program onto it. If not, those details are more than adequately covered at the existing Microbit home site. The only additional component necessary to join the IoT is the LoRaWAN board. Insert the Microbit into the connector and connect both to your host in the usual manner. This is all the hardware necessary. Everything else is software and setup. Thethingsnetwork.org is an open, freely available, cloud-based platform designed specifically for IoT experimentation, and we will use it to prove our connection to the outside world. First, you need an account, so go to the site and enter the required details. Complete the instructions that ask you to confirm your submission by pressing the activate button that appears in the email thethingsnetwork.org will have sent. Follow the links to the dashboard where the power of the world of the Internet of Things will be revealed. It may not look like much here, but every journey starts with but a single step. In this process, we are going to establish a link between your microbit and the cloud. We can then show how the details held in the cloud can be sent to your mobile, your PC, or forwarded to another machine. The initial connection is made using radio, where anybody in range can monitor your communications. It's therefore insecure. Remember, there's no S in IoT. It's still not secure, even once it's been transmitted onto the remaining internet. So we want to encode everything we do with our own encryption. This is also how it's set up. Every user inside the Things Network can establish their own secure links using applications. Once the application is set up, devices are then added and qualified to use the application. It's a two-stage process. Click on Applications to create your individual application. Enter any name you wish, but as we've seen elsewhere, it's good to avoid spaces and full stops in any name you choose. Use camel case or underscore in your name. And I'm not just saying that because I like throttling that camel, but because it can avoid a lot of silly gotchas later on. Press the Create Applications button, and the green flag should appear to prove that all has been accepted. Having completed Stage 1 and set up the application, we now need to add devices to the qualified user list and set up some of the end-to-end -end encryption that's going to protect our data. OTAA stands for Over the Air Authorization. So, with that default tab selected, click on either of the two registered device links to reveal this screen. Enter the EUI shown on the label on the connector. The entry is case insensitive. The register button becomes active once a valid number has been entered. We are going to allow the system to randomly allocate the app key. Well, after all, why make extra work? The green flag should re-emerge, confirming that everything is happy so far. We are now provided with a whole array of numbers provided to confuse, but we are undaunted. This is actually a really well-designed interface. This little eyeball icon reveals all of the secret codes, and these angle brackets change the available viewing options of the numbers in a series of popular formats. This is the option we require, and clicking on this icon copies it directly into the clipboard. I did say this was a nice interface. If you know about Git, then you will know how to duplicate this site. If you don't, you really ought to learn about it, as it's another great interface with some wonderful advantages. In the interim, just click on the options and on any of the files ending .py, the Python files, to see the contents. Select and copy the code and paste it into your preferred MicroPython environment. Somewhere in the code, you will see a quote with BBC MicroTimer in it. This is the message we're going to transmit. If we split the screen, we'll see the code on the right and the things.net page on the left. Here, at the top of the code, are three references labelled App EUI, the application end user interface, Dev EUI, the device end user interface, and the App Key, the application's key. The first identifies your application from amongst all of those using the Things Network, and the next uniquely identifies your device. The application key is the 128 bit number used to encode all of the data that is carried in your link across the system. I've left the default values in the code to show you what code value should look like, but these have to be overwritten with the three values shown on the web page. Copy them across. Now we can quickly jump back to the Things Network page and click on this Edit link next to the words Payload Function. It reveals this page with three tabs. 
The default tab is Decoder. Replace all of the existing code with this. This is a short snippet of code used to decode any message sent across the link. Press Save and Finish. Everything is now ready for the data to be transmitted. Now, go back to the code and press the Flash button. This sends the program down into the micro bit. Two splash screens may also pop up on the screen, but they can be dismissed. Red LEDs light as the program runs and the quote is transmitted. It may take a few seconds, but if all's gone well, the message is presented here in the message block, along with supporting details like the time, frequency, and an indication of the power of the received radio signal, labeled RSSI. So that is it, everything is working. To recap, we have set up an account on the thingsnetwork.org. We've set up an application, entered the EUI details from the label on the front of the device, which then revealed the data to be used across the rest of the link. The application EUI and the application key that is used to unlock the code used to encrypt the data. Data was then transmitted by pressing the flash button and the message seen on the web page proving the link worked. In the next video, we'll see how to handle